levels just keep rising. Flooding in Missouri and Kansas. That's the Sherman Torrey, the coolest Kansas City. During the spring and summer of 2011, the entire Missouri River Basin faced an unprecedented flood in both scale and duration. Several communities were threatened in both the upper and lower basin. Thousands of acres of farmland lay submerged under many feet of water. Homes were lost. Lives forever changed. How could this happen in a basin that only four years ago emerged from hard drought? During the weekend of May 20th to the 22nd, uh, very heavy rain fell over the eastern portion of Montana, western Dakotas, and northern Wyoming, five to eight inches in an area that normally gets 12 to 14 inches of rain a year. And as we watched that uh, rain fall and then show up at the gauges uh, during that following week, we realized that our flexibility to manage the reservoir system uh, was quickly being taken away from us. The Missouri River Basin encompasses all or parts of 10 different states from its headwaters in Montana down more than 2,300 miles to its confluence with the Mississippi River at St. Louis. It is a region that has experienced significant flooding. The rampaging waters are reported reaching crests four and five feet above the highest defenses and for a while it seems that many communities will be engulfed. But cities like Council Bluffs and Omaha and many others, although suffering damage, hold off the river. During the late 1940s through the early 1950s, the Missouri River flooded almost every year. It wasn't uncommon for residents living in the communities along the basin to reside in portable homes and villages that could be moved as the waters rose. Congress passed the Flood Control Act of 1944 that authorized the construction of six main stem dams to attempt to tame the mighty Mo. Those dams, Fort Peck, Garrison, Owahi, Fort Randall, Big Bend, and Gavin's Point, operate as a system to regulate water flows, with decisions made at each having impacts along the entire basin. At the beginning of the runoff season, the full flood capacity of the six main stem projects on the Missouri was available. That flood capacity, 16.3 million acre feet, has been sufficient for runoff and precipitation for every year on record in the basin, all the way back to 1898. But late May and June held a nasty surprise with both the third highest and the highest single month of runoff in basin history. Back to back months we had almost a year's annual runoff in the Missouri River Basin and so that has really made it into a historic event, an unprecedented event and one that exceeded the reservoir design flood as well. Adding to this problem was cooler temperatures throughout the basin that slowed the melting of the already record snowpack in the region. This meant that much of the snowpack moisture would coincide with precipitation in the region and not allow either to be safely evacuated out of the system prior to the inflows from the other. To keep the main stem dams from overtopping and resulting in uncontrolled releases, the Missouri River Reservoir Control Center worked with the Omaha and Kansas City districts to develop a release schedule. That schedule would aggressively evacuate floodwaters from the upper reaches of the basin throughout the system while striking a balance by delaying the highest releases for as long as possible. Recognizing the impacts the high water releases would have on the basin, the Corps activated its emergency operations centers in Omaha and Kansas City. Early on, a Missouri River Joint Information Center was stood up to provide public communication support to both districts and to the impacted public. From the beginning of this event, the Corps recognized the need for clear and transparent communication with the public. Well, we had very good communication, uh, good relationships, I should say, with the local levy sponsors prior. Um, but it allows them to fully understand the public, to fully understand what is transpiring and, and what the impacts are going to be from this particular flood event in terms of high flows coming out of Gavin's Point. Since May 30th, the Corps has held a nightly informational teleconference for stakeholders, legislators, and the media. In those calls, Corps leadership would present information as well as field questions from participants. How much um, would you say cost, that there's going to be a cost? Do you have an estimate yet of what the cost is? No, I, I wouldn't want to give an estimate until we re really get in there. Um, as I've said, we've seen the actual dams function very well, but as you, as you stated, there are some areas of concern from the high water that, that will need to be addressed. So um, th those will all come to light as we're able to drop the water and really get in and look at the structures. 
The calls ran 78 straight days before going to a weekday schedule. The Joint Information Center sent out more than 74 press releases, developed a magazine, as well as nearly two dozen video segments on the flood. Up-to-date information was posted on Facebook, garnering more than 11,000 followers during the course of the flood. With high releases coming, the Corps set about helping communities prepare for the water. The initial focus came in the north, where Corps personnel began contracting and supervising work on the construction of temporary levees and other advanced measures to protect critical infrastructure. In the communities of Bismarck and Mandan in North Dakota, as well as Pierre, South Dakota, massive building efforts were launched as the start date for high releases approached. We have, we've had good materials, we've had good moisture content, I mean, we are, we are really in good shape right now. Now, uh, with the time we had to build these and the construction methods used. They are solid. In all, the following flood fighting supplies were issued by the Corps. 15.1 million sandbags, 8,200 linear feet of 3-foot HESCO, 66,070 linear feet of 4-foot HESCO, 2,836 rolls of poly, 48 pumps, and 2,531 sling bags. The high water releases, upwards of 160,000 cubic feet per second at five of the six main stem dams, meant opening the spillway gates at several of the projects to pass floodwaters for the first time in their history. Those spillways had, of course, been open for routine maintenance from time to time, but had never been used for their emergency purpose. The only spillway gate not opened was at Oahe, where the spillway apron is earthen cut. Running floodwaters through that project would have resulted in substantial erosion and a high cost to repair following the event. To ensure that the projects are performing well under stress, the Corps ramped up its surveillance of the dams and performed inspections and maintenance as needed, such as at Garrison Dam where a spall was spotted during its initial release of floodwaters from the spillway gates. That led to a thorough inspection of the apron and subsequent sealing of some surface erosion. Uh, we expect that uh, this, this should be a permanent fix. Um, We've done some research on the material. A lot of it is you know, dependent upon the workmanship. We've been down there working with the contractor, inspecting his work. Uh, we're, we're confident we'll have a good solid fixer that should hold up for several years. With its unique position as the southernmost of the main stem dams and the final gateway from the large northern reservoirs, Gavin's Point became a critical focus for the remainder of the Missouri River Basin. Communities sought to gauge the level of flooding that they might experience based on past hydrologic data and planned releases from that project. To help, both Kansas City and Omaha District developed detailed inundation maps and posted them online for the public to use and assess their level of risk. Understanding risk is important for the public to make well-informed decisions. The key for us now is, is to continue to make sure we take care of public safety and life and property and work together as a team. That's the all hands on deck. That's making sure we operate the system as a system. Uh, continue to work together, inform people of the risks, so everybody understands the risk at hand. We try to mitigate that risk, but there's always going to be risk there. That risk played out in real time in early June as a series of breaches on Federal Levy L-575 threatened the community of Hamburg, Iowa. The Corps immediately began construction of a secondary line of defense for the town, using a mix of earthen levees and HESCO barriers placed along Interstate 29. What we're doing here is the uh, Highway 29 is the low point in the, uh, the defense that we're putting in here, the Ditch 6 levee. And so what they're doing is raising it up with HESCO bastions on the, uh, the edge of I-29 here. So you can see they're filled with sand. The uh, Iowa National Guard is undertaking this effort. Teams of Corps personnel, area contractors, community volunteers, and the National Guard worked around the clock to construct the levees, even as the waters approached. It, it, uh, it really brings you home. It, it uh, kind of gives you a sense of purpose. Uh, when we started, you couldn't see water for forever. And, uh, you know, going 24 hours is very tiring. It, but once the water started, then you can saw a lot of added in energy to folks and uh, trying to get things accomplished. So. As the high waters moved further down the Missouri River, the southern basin faced an all too familiar threat. Inspired here is you have both the upper and lower basin in a full flood fight, and that's that's much different than what the previous flood fights have been, which have been lower basin centric. With waters remaining against levees for such a long time, the nature of the flood fight changed. 
water seeks to equalize pressure on both sides of a levee. One way it accomplishes this is to seek out any porous materials in or beneath a levee. The water can combine with internal groundwater and recent rains or interior drainage to begin pooling on the land side of a levee in a process known as seepage. Seepage in a flood is both natural and to be expected. Seepage can be a problem though if it is moving with enough pressure to carry materials from beneath a levee. This can erode the structural integrity of a levee and lead to its failure. To counteract this process, some levees are designed with a seepage berm, an added area of earthen fill behind a levee that acts to lengthen that seepage path and allow water pressure to dissipate over a greater area. Both of these impacts reduce the chance that seepage might pipe material. In areas where seepage appears to be moving material through the formation of sand boils with cloudy water, a new seepage berm can be installed using a variety of techniques or approaches. They all basically function as this filter layer for the seepage water, uh, but they're designed a little different each time depending on the characteristics of the, the ground they're built on, whether it's firm, whether it's soft, whether there's standing water on it. Um, what kind of a traffic it can take from a construction equipment. With the beginning of August, the end of the flooding event becomes a fixture on the horizon. The Corps had already begun preparations for this eventuality. In addition to the creation of a drawdown schedule for releases from the main stem reservoirs, the leadership recognized a few things would need to take place. And once we've done that assessment, uh, determine the best way ahead, uh, both uh, policy-wise, operationally, structurally, uh, to address the need as quickly as we can and then put together uh, an estimate uh, in terms of resourcing. Additionally, with several records shattered underneath its size and scope, the flood of 2011 would become a new data point for managing the Missouri River. This is a new data point in history and as part of our post-flood analysis we'll do a careful assessment and uh, determine the path forward. Is it wise to make a decision on how to control flooding based off of a single year? That's a question both the Corps and the greater public will struggle with in the coming months. Whatever the decisions made, there is little doubt that 2011 will go down as one of the worst flooding events in the history of the Missouri River Basin. From that perspective, the accomplishment of the Corps and the communities along the river are nothing short of a miracle born in hard sweat and even harder decisions.